Thank you very much, Diana. Uh, I know that it is uh, 11, and so if you do have to leave, please, uh, please do so. But I think uh, for some of the rest of us, it would be uh, a pleasure to continue the conversation. So uh, if we could again get underway, any questions or comments for, for Diana? Thanks so much, Diana. Uh, my name is Nick Falvo. I'm a fellow member of the Alternative Federal Budget Working Group, so great to have you here. Um, we are on a university campus, and Carleton, like a lot of universities, has an exclusivity contract with a big food and beverage company called Aramark. And uh, the way these uh, contracts work is, uh, you know, you, you, ha you have to order food from that company. If, if this event had wanted to order you know, coffee or beverages from some uh, small co-op, they would have either had to have snuck it by the Aramark folks or asked for special permission. Um, and I'm just wondering, as with, on a campus with young people who've left home for the first time, are cooking for themselves, are learning to live independently, what do these exclusivity contracts that university campuses have with these companies do for food security? Well, um, I have a feeling Kathleen may, may, may also have uh, things to say about that. I, I would put you in touch with an organization called Meal Exchange, which does work on campus food security issues and um, I think has some interesting work to do. Also, I mentioned the, um, the certification uh, organization, Local Food Plus, and they have actually managed to change some university, I think it's University of Toronto, um, they've actually managed to change the bad old contracts and replace them with new contracts that are uh, both economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable. So my view is if it's a bad contract, break it. And, you know, I, I, I can't help but think of, you know, when I was in university, it was apartheid. And we had to, fall, you know, we had to force the banks who uh, were on campus to disinvest from, from South Africa. And um, I think it's very important to use those kind of pressure tactics. And if they're not going to change the kind of food they serve, then somebody else should be serving the food. And frankly, uh, I find the awareness of food amongst younger people just so much greater than the awareness amongst my generation. So it's, it's time to change these things right in our communities, I think. But Meal Exchange and Local Food Plus would be two good places to start. They're both McConnell grantees, by the way. Thank you. Yes, they are. And Sierra Youth Coalition is another part of that uh, group. Yep. Another question over here. Hi. I'm Elizabeth McAllister, and I'm a consultant. Uh, right now, one of my key clients is the Food and Agriculture Organization. <clears throat> I work largely on the strategy and management side. Uh, I'm not an agronomist. <laughs> um, but I, I would like to sort of pose what might perhaps be a provocative question. And that's based on the fact that right now, globally, there are 178 million chronically malnourished people. Mm -hmm. There are 55 million children that are wasted. And 870 million people suffer from chronic hunger. And I'm looking at... Um, some of the investment in agriculture right now. And I just finished um, another piece with FAO and doing uh, an evaluation on the uh, FAO support to investment. And we came across a number of programs that are just starting now. It's sort of all connected with Obama and his, his key issue being food security. And uh, what's been going on at the G8 and G20 in terms of food programming. And uh, under the World Economic Forum, there's a new initiative for agriculture. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, uh, the companies have set a goal of 20% reduction in food, in um, water use over the, every decade until 2050. 20% increase in small farmer production, which is not subsistence poor, I recognize that, but nonetheless, small farmer production particularly women, and 20% uh, increase in food, uh, access to food, based on the fact that uh, FAO, depending on what department you talk to, predict that by 2050, we'll have to uh, increase the world's food supply, uh, access to the world's food supply, mm -hmm. by 50% to 70%. 
so in looking at what, what the companies are trying to do and the corporations, particularly Unilever, which seems to be a leader now in more value-based uh, corporate activity, I'm wondering if you are working or thinking of working with the corporate sector to try to, try to bring them on board and to work with those that are trying to uh, shift values within their organization, like Mars. Um, and uh, what your thoughts are, if any, on the uh, WF program thing. Thank uh, you. All based on the fact that perhaps we can't do it without them. Yeah. Right. So who would like to start responding to that? Diana, Kathleen? Um, well, there was a lot there. <laughs> the, um, so, I mean, of course, we have... Uh, we, we must work with corporations because corporations are delivering the food. Um, uh, it, it, it's a little bit like saying, oh, well, we're not going to work with the market. Well, I mean, that's, that's nice. But um, it's not going to work over the longer term. But it seems to me that the size, the reduced number and the increased size the incredibly reduced number of corporate actors over all components of our food system, from seeds to fertilizers to pesticides to uh, land ownership to retail, I, and I, I miss some. <laughs> yeah, like the whole processing industry. Kathleen's much better at this part than I am. Um, we, we, we have an incredible problem of corporate concentration in the, in, in the food system, and, and this globally. And um, there's an excellent report put out by the Etcetera Group called Who Owns the Green Economy that really breaks this down internationally for each, um, each sector of, of, of the food system. So I have no illusions that... Um, you know, I can go and sit down with the CEO of those companies and say, well, civil society would like to talk to you. In fact, we've tried to do that, and we've not been invited to the table. And I think one of the most dangerous things going on right now in food policy is that corporations are pretending to speak for all of us. And this is very, very obvious right now under the conference board's process. It's, it's a process led by investors where Loblaws and Nestle and Pepsi and Maple Leaf and McCain's and all of them sit at the table and are coming up with the, what they're calling a national food strategy. So they're calling this a national food strategy. And there are some non-corporate voices, very few, very few at the table. And they had to be wealthy because you have to pay a lot of money to sit at the table. They're, part, they're not participants, they're investors. And they are parading across the country like this is some neutral, um, uh, for the benefit of us all, initiative. And their number one goal is industry prosperity. You can go look at their papers, and the number one goal is industry prosperity. It's not sustainability. It's not hunger. It's not health. And it's not safety. It's none of those things, although they will dress up industry prosperity and all of those things. And as long as there's no new regulations and all we have is voluntary standards on sodium and so on, then it will be, all be fine. So um, I think what we need to do uh, is, 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 is develop a counterpower to that in order to be able to engage in, in, a, in a proper conversation about that. And that normally is the role of government. Right? to mediate those things, to ensure that private interest does not run out or does not uh, win out over, over public interest. Um, but that's clearly not happening in, in, in the current situation. And I mean, with regard to the, the hunger statistics that you mentioned, it's, it's unbelievable that we're still at, at 800 million people who are hungry in this world, and that's a conservative estimate, as I'm sure you know. But for the first time, the number of people who are obese in this world has outstripped the number of people who are hungry. This is the other pole. This, this is the nonsensical system, food system, in which we are living. So 
I don't have any solutions to that. I guess uh, it does get back to, um, I, I do see it as the role of government to bring all those actors around the table and not to just do the bidding of one sector of those actors and criticize everybody on the other side.